Welcome to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher, where we take you behind the scenes with peak performers to learn what makes them tick and discover how you can apply their lessons to your life. I'm your host, Molly Fletcher. Today's guest is breaking grass ceilings everywhere. As the first female to coach in the NFL, Dr. Jen Welter broke that barrier as the Arizona Cardinals linebackers coach in the summer of 2015. That was the latest of many firsts for Jen. After an all-star career in women's football, Jen also became the first woman to play running back in a men's professional football league as a member of the Texas Revolution and went on to coach the team. Jen was named one of the 25 most influential women in sports by ESPNW, and her inspiring story has been shared in the New York Times, Vogue, the Huffington Post, and Fortune. To add to her accolades, she has a master's degree in sports psychology, a doctorate in psychology, and a degree in business from Boston College. On today's episode, Jen shares the importance of authentic leadership, the value of diverse teams, and how to get comfortable taking risks. You can follow Jen on Twitter at jwelter47, and be sure to check out her new book, Play Big. Here's my conversation with Dr. Jen Welter. So Dr. Jen Welter, tell me how you first fell in love with the game of football and and how you sort of got started playing. You know, I grew up in Vero Beach, Florida, where football is Friday night life. It's a way of life. And uh, to me, it was like those were the superheroes. And I was just enchanted by the sport, though I didn't have an opportunity to play. Closest I got was in college when I got to play rugby because I thought it was football without the pads. And So I immediately fell in love with that sport as well. Played for all four years, got recruited to try out for the under-23 national team, at which time they promptly told me I was really good, but far too small. And um, about a year later, I was playing flag football on weekends and still teaching aerobics. And the general manager from a team called the Massachusetts Mutiny called the league and said, do you have anybody playing in your league who you think could play tackle? And I said, yep, we have one for you. And uh, I went to an open tryout, and I made it. And at that point, I just promised myself that I would do whatever I needed to to be in the game, and then I would step up to whatever challenge came my way. So I I didn't really realize how big or painful at times those challenges would be. Mm Mm-hmm. Maybe that was good, though, right, in a way? Absolutely. Yeah. I often say, and this is how I look at it, people say, oh, well, you know, did you have a vision of this? Could you see it? No, absolutely not. You know, there were, there were no girls who were coaching in the NFL that I could look at and say, I want to be her when I grow up. So it was never even a whisper of a shadow of a thought, right? And so I, I love to say that I think at times um, God put blinders on me so I wouldn't get blinded and look up and get distracted by the stadium lights Mm -hmm. you know sometimes that's what it is yeah and it probably kind of kept you from getting in your own head I would imagine at at, at times absolutely when you're in a pursuit of you know this love and this passion and this game that you want to be a part of you'll do a whole lot more than if it's just you maybe have one end game in mind and that's either right or wrong it's either a win or a loss like I always looked at it as every single woman who was playing football, you know, doing what we weren't supposed to do was winning by just being involved in the game. And when that's your focus, you'll, you'll pivot, you'll adjust, you'll, you'll just keep going, even if it's not always pretty polished and perfect, which it certainly wasn't. (laughs) And, and you were of course the first woman hired as a coach in the NFL, which is just remarkable and, and it sounds like you every day just woke up and did a little bit more and a little bit more. And there you were, you know, um, through a ton of hard work. And like you said, God, maybe put blinders on you. But, you know, why is breaking barriers, in your opinion, so important in life? 
because it changes what's possible. Like I told you, I never once imagined that the NFL was even a possibility because I couldn't look and see it. Yeah. But once you see it, it changes the the vision of where you could be. You know, you could walk a mile in someone's shoes or play a game in their cleats because it's been done. That was like the four minute mile. Once once the four minute mile was run once, people started breaking it over and over and over. And I think that that's the power of it. You know, I get pictures from moms and dads and, and these are some of my most prized possessions when they're like excited that their daughter's playing football or look, their daughter was a football coach for Halloween. You know, those things to me are, are some of the most worthwhile moments because though I love the game, my mind would never even wonder or wander that far. And that's what happens when you break barriers. You know, and the thing I would say on breaking barriers is I often struggle with one thing and that's like, oh, Jen, you did so well. Well, let's be perfectly honest. What set that situation up was the man that is Bruce Arians and everybody at the Arizona Cardinals because he had to be willing to risk his legacy, his coaching career on me and to bet on me to make that possible. And to really go into this situation where he set it up that he got, you know, I've talked to Bruce about it. And he was like, I went to the players first and they were all for it. You know, those guys were for it. And, you know, Steve and Michael Bidwell were for it and the coaching staff. So he had buy-in before I, I even walked in the door. Because the truth is, and you know this, if they had not wanted me there, it didn't matter if I was Bruce Arians in a skirt, right? If I was just as brilliant as Bruce. If they didn't want me there, they wouldn't have listened and I wouldn't have even had an opportunity. So, yes, I did a great job, but I did a great job with great men and great people who supported me and made it possible. And that's why it went so well. Bruce, I mean, he's so well respected as a coach. What did you learn from him? I mean, I'm sure there's so much, right? But is there a story maybe of a time? Oh, yeah. Well, Bruce has a motto. It's no risk, no biscuits. No risk, no biscuits. Yeah, no (laughs) risk, no biscuits, you know. And he really does go with that. But I think that the thing I would take from Bruce that I think any leader should go with is he is that guy. You know what I mean? Like, Mm -hmm. he he makes you feel in five minutes like you've known him your whole life. I, I mean, here I was, this young female coach, the closest I'd ever been to an NFL sidelines was, you know, the nosebleed section because women's football, we sure couldn't afford any of the good seats. Um, at a, you know, when you're making a dollar a game, you're certainly not paying thousands to go watch it, even if you love it, you know. And here I am, this coach who essentially came from nowhere, and he invited me out to OTAs, and we're talking on the sidelines. And he was so easy. You know what I mean? He made me feel so welcome and so natural. It literally went through my mind. Like, I know why everybody loves him. I would run through a wall for this guy. And I didn't know at that time that I would run through several. But the truth is that he never would have set me up to run through a wall that he didn't know there was a soft spot behind it. And that's what makes him great. You know, that is what makes him great. And um, he really is that guy. You know, I think we live in a world where, you know, taking risks and sometimes failing is scary for so many people, right? Um, What advice would you have for people to get more comfortable taking risks, right? To step into these sort of unknown spots and go for it. Well, I'll I'll tell them a story from my my own past, right? My first love was tennis. And I had a coach who told me because my size and my build, I'd never be strong enough to play pro tennis. So you're too small not going to be good enough. Great. Same thing happened in rugby, right? Like I told you, try out for the under 23 national team, too small. When I had the opportunity to try out for my first football team, I couldn't help but fear that I would get turned down again. And I really struggled with it. I thought, well, what if they tell me no again? What if this happens? And what I realized is I could live with being too small. I'd been too small my whole life. 
But what I couldn't live with was wondering for the rest of my life, what would have happened if I would have just tried out for that football team? And I tell that humbly because, you know, as I talk to you, I'm a woman who played football for about 15 years. We won four championships or, you know, men's version would be Super Bowls on teams that I played on, two gold medals. I think I was an eight or nine time all-star and I made history in men's professional football three times. And I had that same fear that everybody struggles with from time to time of what if I don't make it? What if it doesn't go well? What if I fail? But the truth is, if I hadn't gone to that tryout, it would have been the same exact outcome as if I would have tried and failed. So your failure is already guaranteed if you don't go for it. That's an awesome way to, to look at it. So what do you tell yourself to put yourself out there and step out there and, and go for the tryout or the interview or the, the thing that the world would look at and say, you're not qualified for this, but you did it anyway. What did you tell yourself to sort of make that leap, right? And to sort of let go of maybe perfection and, and just focus on progress. You know, I still struggle with it. And I think everybody does, right? Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. Especially in, in this, society that we have today where everything is Instagram filters, right? And nobody looks like they do in real life, right? We see this pretty polished, perfect version of everything. And we get instant gratification from likes on, you know, likes on Facebook and Instagram that make us think, oh, this is what it's all about, right? This is validation. This is success. And yet the truth is that nothing is perfect and that's okay. And I still struggle in my certain areas of, you know, this needs to be perfect. But what I've gotten better at and what I'm still a work in progress at is telling you where I'm bad, right? Because I think when you'll admit where you're bad, people are also better at allowing you to be an expert where you're an expert, okay? For example, I can throw me up in, in front of thousands of people to play football or to give a speech no worries, all good, right? To some people, that's scary, right? But I played my football career for a dollar a game, right? You don't want me doing the P&L statements for your company. You don't want me doing your valuation because I'm still a little skewed and I'm still not great at that. But there are people who are very good and say, hey, Jen, the dollar amount of you going and doing that is X, right? And that's why... That's why you have a team. And I think that that's where we have to get better is not always just worried about being perfect, but being better about owning our own strengths and weaknesses and looking for ways to store that up. You know, hey, put me in a meeting. I will wow them. They will fall in love with me. And you go ahead and close the deal. We're a great team. Right. right? Sure. And sure. I, and I think that that's what we need to do better at is realizing that and what it took for me was the shift from being one of the best players in the world, right? Being one of the toughest linebackers, that person you would put in the game because you wanted to torture the quarterback. That was me, right? That was my career in women's football. I was that player. I was a nightmare to play against. And the first one you loved as a teammate, you'd be like, oh my gosh, Walter, I thought you'd be so crazy and like a horrible person. I'm like, no, 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 no. That's just how I play football. I love you very much though. Right. You know? But I'm, I'm out here to win. Right. It was yeah. a persona and I was a fierce competitor and I was one of the best. The difference is that when I went into men's football, all of a sudden I'm not the best, right? I'm not the best athlete in the team. I'm, I am scratching and clawing to be on the bottom rung. So how do you become a great teammate when you're not that player anymore? And it caused me to realize that there were a whole lot of other ways that I could be a great teammate than just by being the best athlete. And I would encourage anybody to constantly look at where they can be a great teammate and to not feel like you have to do everything by yourself. And when you're not doing it by yourself, it's a whole lot less lonely and it's a whole lot less scary. Is that what sort of drew you into the coaching space a little bit? I mean, when you transitioned as a player into a coach? Tell me a little bit about that transition and how you started to see it as an option for yourself. Not every player becomes a coach, right? I actually never saw it as an option for myself, nor did I ever 
go after it. Okay. I was actually, as I like to say, I was punted into the position because uh, Wendell Davis, who's a former Dallas Cowboy, became the Texas Revolution coach um, the year after I played. And we met at an event where he just so happened to see how all the guys reacted to me. And he didn't recognize me. Now, he'd seen me in all the game film and all the news stories. But, you know, I, I mean, I wasn't in football gear. I was dressed up for, like, business. And, you know, you know that shift. Sometimes we don't look the same. And he saw how all the guys responded to me. And he said, who is this girl that all my guys love? And he said it to his defensive coordinator who just started laughing. And he's like, coach, that's your running back. And he was like, what? And, he, you know, we've talked about this since then. He's like, Jen, I knew everything about you. What I didn't expect is that my guys would love you like that. I thought that they tolerated you. I didn't think that it would be that respect that they had because that's a tough situation. You know, a girl playing on a men's team. Um, and so it made him curious and he pulled me aside and him and Devin grilled me on football and the organization and all of this stuff. And, you know, I thought I was done. So I had nothing to lose. Right. So you want to talk football? We'll talk football. You want to talk what's good with the team? I'll tell you everything you need to know. Because I'm just going to make sure that my teammates are in a better position when I leave than when I came. That was my whole point. And so I did. And the next day, uh, Wendell called me and he said, all Devin and I could talk about on our way home was that you needed to coach this football team. And I said, oh, no, absolutely not. I don't want to coach football. And you want to throw me right into men's professional football? No, no, no. And so he said, not a lot of guys are going to give you this opportunity. You're taking this job. And I said, no. And I hung up on him. <laughs> and <laughs> yep, wow, I did. And uh, Wendell called me back the next day. And he said, you remember how I told you not a lot of guys were going to give you this opportunity and that you were taking this job? And I said, yeah. And he said, great, because I took it for you. And I already told him. And you can't quit now because then the narrative will be, we had a girl once and she quit. And I lovingly say that Wendell saw something in me before I even saw it in myself. And so it was not something I set out to do. I was not banging down the doors of men's professional football saying, you have to let me coach. Um, at each step along the way, it was really uh, men who saw something in me and believed me and, and put me in that position to learn. Wow. That is a, uh, that is a really cool story. And, and it's funny because I think any coach, regardless of their gender, you know, has to be able to earn the respect of the players. And that can be hard, certainly at the professional level. What was your approach to create that connection and, and mutual respect? To listen before I talk, to be very personal. It's tough when you're a player and, you know, I obviously had had coaches like this where, you know, they would come at you and think that they had all the answers before they even knew what the questions were. And I didn't want to be like that. I wanted to evaluate first and see where I could best help and then do it in a way that never caused the guys to feel like they had to, to basically bow up. You know, I wasn't going to get in their face. It just doesn't even make sense, right? And so me as a coach, I'd, I'd be more likely to pull you aside and be like, hey, okay, so next time that happens, just try this. See what happens. You know, like it was like almost a little ace in your pocket. And it was very beneficial. And also, you know, I do have a doctorate in sports psychology. So coach-athlete relationships and athletes in general are my sweet spot. Um, if you took the coach title out, I would be the exact same person doing the exact same thing. It would just be a lot more life X's and O's than football ones. Well, and I'm sure, I mean, you have a doctorate in, in sports psychology, right? So I imagine that that came in handy, didn't it? Oh, only every minute of every day. Oh my gosh, I can only imagine. I mean, I as when I was a sports agent, I used to say to kids who wanted to become a sports agent, just study psychology because that's really what this is all about. Tell me other ways that that kind of came in handy and how you utilize that to serve the team. Sometimes it might be in a personal conversation. You know, it's funny. I think that dynamic, whether it was that I was a female coach or a, or a doctor of psychology, probably both at times would be like, hey, coach, do you have a minute? Yeah, absolutely. What's up? 
oh man, coach, my wife is so mad at me and I don't even know what I did. <laughs> right. But yeah. you know, as well as I do, first of all, I would tell him I'm an expert in male to female translation. So let's talk. <laughs> right. Yeah. So not only does it help them in, in, in their personal life and their comfort level, but it allows them to get their mind back to the game. Because if you're worried about a fight at home, you're certainly not able to memorize a playbook that's as thick as the Bible. Right. So a, a lot of being a great professional athlete is being able to have your mind in that moment and completely absorbed in the situation. And, and it is intense. So that would be one way. And another way would be maybe just seeing the differences in players and, and where they might need, you know, the difference between a high five, a, a hug and a kick in the butt. You know, Bruce, that's another thing that Bruce is really big on. He says his question regarding me and even about me, one of the things he said is that he loved how I could read the guy's eyes. And you'll hear Bruce say, read the guy's eyes a lot. And, and that really means can you tap into the individual and see what that individual needs that might be different from somebody else. And it might be different from one day to the next. Can you read them? Bruce says that he learned how to read somebody's eyes back in the day when he was a bartender. And it really is about tapping into that player as an individual and, and maximizing that personal connection to help them in their professional career. Mm-hmm. That's amazing when he was a bartender. So he'd look at him and go, dude, you're done. Go home. I'm not serving mm-hmm. you. <laughs> yeah. Or he'd be like, oh, man, this guy is just out to lunch. Or, right. He's know. struggling. Yeah. Sure. What message would you have for leaders about the importance of, of diversity on teams, right? And particularly within leadership teams. I mean, you brought, obviously, a tremendous amount of diversity into a space that wasn't accustomed to that level of diversity. Tell me a little bit about your philosophy around that. It's interesting because people would say, well, what made you a better coach? Nothing. It's not about being better or worse. That's why you have a team. What it is is about how many different voices can you have at a table? Can you look at a situation in a slightly different way or see things from a different vantage point? When I talk about uh, diversity, I usually refer to a diamond, right? On the street, a diamond is nothing. It looks just like any other stone. But where it truly gets its beauty, its brilliance, and its value is with each facet and each dimension that's revealed. And that's what diversity is. It is really taking a situation and adding those different facets and brilliant vantage points. Yes, each person, based on their background, looks at things differently. And each player or, you know, or employee, or, or, you know, if you're in a business, is going to relate to somebody differently. If everybody looks the same, it's going to be really hard to believe that, that somebody is going to understand you. And you want to be able to have all of those dimensions in the conversation. And I would say it's not only having diversity, but welcoming diversity of point of view. Okay? You can have people on a staff that don't have a voice. And that's not really doing what you want to do. What you want to do is make sure that that intellectual curiosity, that 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 voice and vision of the different people that you have and their different talents is really put into a position where it can be heard and it can be embraced and it can be brought to the surface. Because otherwise, you know, you're going to have situations where go, let's go to sports, right? You wonder why that sports bras were just absolutely terrible and stagnant for who knows how many years. Well, it's because no women were in the design process. I mean, let's think about it. Guys never had to jump up and down. And, and I certainly don't, you know, I'm not a big chested woman, but I, I mean, even by being in the locker room with some of my teammates, I could see that it was the problem. Right? I'd watch people use eight bandages and three sports bras to try and be able to play football. Clearly, there's a problem. But if you didn't have women at the table discussing that problem who had experienced it or seen it or witnessed it, you're never going to fix that problem. And that's what diversity is, both in perspective and in thought. But you have to make sure that you not only have those people, but that those people feel like they have a say. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's good stuff. I mean, that is, uh, I couldn't agree with you more. And you know, it's funny. I mean, you're, you've been a woman in a man's world. I think I've, I've walked there too. And, but what I'm hearing from you, that's kind of cool. And, and I feel the same way is that I'm really, really grateful for men. I mean, I made a living working with mostly male athletes and they gave me a shot. No different than it sounds like the football guys gave you an opportunity and a shot. Um, so I'm sure you, uh, do a lot of things to support young women. And I know there's incredible stories of ways you've inspired young girls that, that love the game of football. But it sounds to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you also value and appreciate the platform that men have given you. Oh, without a doubt. You know, in a world where there were no women, the only one who can give you a shot is men. I, I mean, that's just the truth. I, I, I'm not saying that women wouldn't have helped me if they were there. That's certainly not what I'm saying. But there were no women there. so the shots had to come from men and the men in my life have been very supportive and influential and at the same time would never let me get away with anything. And I appreciate that so much because I think one of the things I would tell women who that I think we maybe get off track of sometimes is to win in a man's world. It does not mean that we have to be anti-men, and it also doesn't mean that we have to be men. Amen. Amen, girl. I feel you on that totally. I will never outman them, and I don't want to. I want to be that different voice, and I want to be able to say, guess what? You know, I want to be a champion for them as much as they've been a champion for me, you know? And I've, I've at times gotten blowback or pushback because they're like, oh, well, you're, you're just all about the guy. No. No, but I am going to defend them because in a situation that, you know, and not just once, but in several situations, in all of my experiences in men's professional football, um, both in arena and in the NFL, those guys looked out for me and they didn't have to. They chose to. They had your back. They had my back. And that means that it's my obligation as, you know, and, and I'm sure this is the same way for you because, you know, you're one of the few women who's really walked in that world. It's my obligation to stand up for them and to say, you know what, there are great guys there. Yep. You have heard about a knucklehead. I get it. That was a bad thing to do. That is one bad dude, but it does not reflect on every man who plays men's professional football, right? It, it does not. And here are countless examples. You know, it's like, there are bad apples in every profession. We just hear about it a lot more in professional sports because they're under a microscope. Sure, sure. Well, in the NFL and professional sports at any level, and even inside of organizations and, 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 and businesses, leaders, you know, are always trying to sort of maximize their capacity, right? And we live in a world where there's just physically, mentally, emotionally, relationally, where people, a lot of people I know are grinding it, Right and pulling it and pushing it at both ends. And, you know, you were at the highest level as a coach and, and as a player and, and you were around guys and, and that were at the highest level. What, what advice do you give people about how to prepare sort of physically, mentally, emotionally, et cetera, to compete at the highest level and stay there? Number one, realize that the difference at the highest level is not physical, it's mental. Physically, most people are, are pretty close, Right. You're talking about 0.001 second on your 40 time, right? When you put it in pads, a lot of times it doesn't even translate, okay? So physically, you have to be there. That's not a, a nice to have, it's a must have, right? You, you physically have expectations, and that is, that is not going to go away. It's not going to change, and it's an obvious component. But the differences at the highest level are not physical, they're mental, meaning you have to be a smart player on and off the field. You have to know the playbook. You have to do all those things, but you also have to be mentally disciplined to make the choices that will set you up for success, right? Set up stability in your life. Set up people that you trust and you can leave certain aspects of your life, not without your thought, but to be well run where you're you know, where you're checking in as opposed to micromanaging. You don't have the mental cycles, right? You have to find people who you trust and make sure 
that you're getting them from really well-respected people because that's where a lot of the professional athletes struggle. You know, everybody's going to tell you he can make you a million dollars. Everybody's going to tell you they can make you famous. Everybody's going to tell you that every investment is great. No one's going to tell you, hey, dude, I'm going to come up and rip off all your money. No one's going to tell you that. They are not going to tell you when they're trying to rip you off or when they're a con artist. They're not going to tell you, I I am absolutely just going to take your money and run. So do your due diligence up front so that when you're in the grind, when you're in training camp, you're not struggling. And that would be in your personal relationships as well, whether it's the person that you want to date, marry, whatever. Make sure that they're on board with that life, right? Not just the life of taking pictures with you, but the training camp when you know, they're not going to hear from you for six weeks, essentially, except for on Tuesdays on the day off. And that she's not going to be calling you every 30 seconds. Like, babe, what's the matter? You don't love me anymore. Like, <laughs> like seriously, like these are real struggles and you got to have somebody who's on your team. That's like, Hey, okay. Um, I know your practices run from this time to this time. I'll make sure that I keep that window open so that we can talk if you want to, if you have a, if you have a break in your day. But I'm not going to text you every five seconds because your coach is going to pick up your phone and throw it across the room, and I might get you cut. Right? right, right. Know the difference and like be willing to have those conversations because that is what goes into being mentally prepared is really all aspects of your life because you say that you leave it, you know, you leave it all behind when you, you step on the field, but you can't to some extent, right? There are lots of hours and you want people who are vested in your success. And that's not just professional athletes. That's anybody. The people in your life should want to see you successful. They should want you to thrive and be willing to say, you know what, when you have a major moment and you want to go out and you want to have a great dinner and celebrate, they'll be there. And also when you tell them I'm on a deadline and I love you, but I need to go in a hole right now. They'll also respect it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Or when you get released. Right. They, they're right beside you. you know? That's right. Um, We're not all of a sudden, well, that was fun while it lasted. Sure. Well, and, and Jen, now I know you've been speaking a lot, and I think I read that you have a new book coming out, right, this fall. Is that right? Mm-hmm. I do. Awesome. Tell me about the book and tell me what you speak about and kind of what else is on the horizon for you, girl. Yeah, so the book is called Play Big. It'll be out October 3rd. It, it is available. Yeah, I'm so excited. It, uh, it is available for pre order now. You can find it on Amazon and all of those things, um, even though we just took the cover shot last week, so you won't see an image yet. But it's a lot of stories from my life, but told in a way that it's really applicable. You know, we tried to take the balance of kind of my journey in the football career, but also some of the insight that came along the way. And, and that's what makes it fun. It's a, it's a good read. You'll enjoy it. And, and don't be intimidated for those of you who are not football people. One of the things I always say is it's not a football story. It's a life story that for me happened to play out on a football field, but it's, it's all of the stories that surround the field. It's actually very little X's and O's. So Anybody can read it, even if you've never watched football before in your life. I can't wait. It sounds awesome. It sounds awesome. Well, I'm going to pre-order it now, girl. I'm going to try to get your numbers up. Get it. Get it. And then, saying in terms of speaking, um, yeah. it's a lot the same stuff, right? That, as I say, a great speaker should be as if we were sitting down together and having a conversation. It just happens to be with thousands of people instead of you and I. Um, so it's a lot of my stories from my career and that same messaging and, th- and that's where the book came from. It's really very much about what I speak. And so some of the topics are authentic leadership, winning in the boys club, playing priceless, you know, and, and being willing to bet on yourself even when nobody else would. Yeah, that's fantastic. And how do people find out about you and book you to speak? You know, you can actually go to my website, which is jenwelter.com. And just contact me directly. Um, I do speak through a few different speakers bureaus, but yeah, it, it is a very simple process. We we just get into it and um, and make it happen. Well, and you know, you talk about authentic leadership a lot, and I wanted to ask you that question. What does that mean to you? Tell me a little bit about what you talk about when you talk about that. 
Well, that comes from a very organic place, right? It comes from a conversation I had on the sidelines with Terry Glenn, who was a phenomenal receiver in the NFL, um, who coached with me at the Revolution. And Terry is, is quiet and very introspective. And he said, Jen, I've been thinking a lot about you going to the NFL. And the best advice I can give you is to be 100% authentic. He said, if you are the same exact person that you were with us here every single day, those guys will absolutely love you. But if you're fake in any way, they will sense it and they'll eat you alive. And at any moment, if I doubted what I thought was the right thing, which was, you know, or how I was acting or, you know, any of those things, I would go back to that and kind of pull my strength from the fact that I didn't have to quote unquote play the game like everybody else was playing it. I had to have my own unique special sauce. And I would tell anybody that, you know, what makes you different is what makes you special. And will everybody like it? No. There are people that I rub the wrong way, I'm sure, on a day-to-day basis. And sometimes it's because the truth is not comfortable, right? But the truth is that if you are going to be with somebody in a tight quarters, right, in training camp where you literally can't leave, right, we are stuck together, it's, it's more intense than marriage. You may not like that person all the time, but you have to know exactly who that person is. Right. You have to know what you can count on them for, who they're going to be from one day to the next and realize that like it, love it, hate it at certain times. It is what it is, because if you know exactly who somebody is, you can deal with it. It's when people reveal themselves to be one thing one day and something else two days later that everybody is off balance. And so. That's what I go back to is authentic leadership and not feeling like you have to lead the way other people lead. I was not going to be effective if I tried to coach the exact same way as some of my male counterparts, even in my just communication style, right? I mean, picture me at five foot two, and I use this example, right? Picture me at five foot two, and at that time we had Calais Campbell, I think was our tallest guy, and he's six foot eight. Picture me trying to scream up at Calais, like get in his face, like, okay, it would have just been funny, first of all, right? Like he probably could have just taken his pinky finger and like flicked me across the field. Now Calais is not that guy, which is why I use him as an example. He's about as sweet as they come when, you know, in terms of demeanor and respect level towards me. So I use him very much on purpose, but for a guy to yell at another guy, it's different than for me to have yelled at him. And the last thing that I wanted to get was somebody to respond that way, right? It just wouldn't have worked. So I am not the same person as any of the other coaches. And I shouldn't feel as though I'm not right if I'm not them. Because I was there to be something different. And to be something different is hard. And it feels lonely at times or challenging. But if you can tap into that core and really bring that difference, then it'll it'll actually become very special. Oh, that's good stuff. I uh, I love that mindset. I love that mindset, and it obviously it, it served you well. Jen, we end, we wrap with a uh, some rapid fire questions. So I'm gonna just hit you with a couple and uh, and just fire off what comes up for you. Does that sound good? Sure. All right. So what's the best advice you've ever received? Other than the authentic leadership. Um, I mean, that really is it. Going back to Terry is to be 100% authentic. Okay. Yeah. Which is, uh, it's easier to be ourselves than anybody else, isn't it? Oh yeah. I'm not comfortable being anybody else. It's probably going to be awkward too. (laughs) What is your life motto? Be the heartbeat in everything that you do. Nice. What's a bad habit you have? Oh, I'm a terrible cook. (laughs) Girl, I feel your pain on that one. Me right. too. What's your morning routine? Depends on the day. Okay. I used to be much more routine, but now I'm not because I travel so much. Right. I try to get some kind of workout in now. Okay. I'm really, 
I'm not one of those bring out of bed, you're going to love me in the morning people. Like it takes me a little bit. So give me some coffee and some exercise and, and then come expect me to have cognitive function. <laughs> you know, knowing what you know now and looking back at you and maybe you were a 15, 16, 17 year old girl, teenage girl, what advice would you give yourself if you could go back then and give yourself that advice? Never, ever minimize your talent, especially not to fit in. Be willing to stand out and, and own all of your wonderful multiple facets. I think too many times girls are programmed to believe that we have to be an or, right? Either you're pretty or you're an athlete or you're smart. Girl, you can be all of them. Just and go ahead and own that. Wow, I love it. So don't be an or. That's cool. No, be an and, not an or. Nice. And that is one of the things. That's one of the chapters in my book. Awesome. And last question: Who's your Super Bowl pick this season? Oh gosh, you know I would love to see the Cardinals make it this year. They've done a lot of moves in the off season with uh, Carson Palmer and Larry Fitzgerald. I know that those two came back because they believe they have a real shot at the Super Bowl because everybody thought that they wouldn't. So let's give my pick to Arizona. Nice. Spoken. Now, would you tell me that if we were having a glass of wine and nobody was listening? You know, I would still <laughs> hope for it. Okay. Um, I mean, there's a few teams that I like. I really like Dallas, too. Okay. Um, I, I, will be, I will be intrigued to see how Dak Prescott does in his second year. I hope Ezekiel Elliott will stay on the right path, uh, mentality speaking. I'm, I'm sad for Tony Romo, but I think he'll do great in the booth. And then the Patriots are always a monster. And then I, I expect the resurgence from Cam Newton. I think he was off last season, but I think he's going to come back as a man on fire this season. Um, and hopefully Luke Keekley will stay healthy. I mean, there's a lot of teams that it really depends. I mean, injury uh, on those top tier teams, injuries are the defining factor. You know that. Sure, I mean, totally. Yeah. On paper, there are several teams right now who could win it all, but they're one play away from a 500 season, right? Or one player, I should say. So there are a few teams that I really like. Those ones really interest me. I think Aaron Rodgers got the best of Dallas. I think Dallas was, you know, they unfortunately lost that game because, you know, you should never underestimate. Aaron Rodgers, and if you don't keep him in the pocket, it's your own fault. I watched him do that two times in a row to Arizona in the playoffs the year before, and uh, they almost knocked him out. But I think that, you know, the Packers ran out of gas after that. You can never count Aaron Rodgers out. I mean, there are so many teams that really excite me, and I think that more than ever, you're going to have some real wild cards this year because there were complete shakeups in certain teams and you have no idea what they're going to come back with. Like. You know, like, let's just take the Buffalo Bills. Who knows what they're going to look like this year? You have a different GM. You have a different entire coaching staff. I've got to anticipate that their on the field presence is going to be completely different, but I do like Arizona for the reasons that I said. And I know, you know, I really like their edge rushing pair, Marcus Bolden, and Chandler Jones off the edge are going to be a, a real monster to handle. Though on defense, they let go of some of my favorite guys, which is always tough. If Ty Matthews healthy, there's no safety better in the game than Ty Matthew. I mean, I the way he reads, he's probably one of my favorite players out there. We, we had a conversation one day in training camp. Um, his nickname was the Honey Badger, and mine was Spider Monkey. And Spider we a, Monkey. Oh, yeah, I was a Spider Monkey. That's awesome. Because, um, you know, I was going to be all over you and we had a great laugh about it but the way he reads the game of football like it he sees things just faster than most people it's a gift and he might be five foot eight but he plays about six foot ten and and he's magic when he's on when he is completely healthy and uninhibited you know and i've seen the difference with some of his injuries which is tough he is a kid playing football who sees it faster than anybody. And that's what makes him so electric is, you know, he would say like, I'd be like, Ty, you read that from a mile away. He'd be like, I'm going to make plays coach. I'm going to make plays. And, and so if he's back on that defense, it, it's a completely different animal. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, the ability to see stuff like he does. I mean, to me, that was one of the things that I always admired about Peyton Manning is his ability to see what was happening. I mean, he, he was given the green light to call tons of audibles, wasn't he? Because he could see stuff in real time that so many quarterbacks didn't see. I think that Peyton Manning, by the end of his career, I would be surprised if he wasn't he wasn't calling probably 80% of his yeah, plays. And I and right. I don't know that because I don't know Peyton. I would love to. So put that out there. I would love to meet him. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's but, out there now, uh, girl. It's out there. But, yeah, his brilliance is his analytics on the field. And that's what most people miss about football if you're just a casual fan. It's the chess pieces, right? I always say football is full contact chess. And Peyton Manning... He's an absolute chess master. On that line of scrimmage, he could read and analyze the, all the pieces of the equation faster than anybody. And that's one of the things that you see as quarterbacks develop. Coaches give them more and more options, more and more freedom. Right? That's why sometimes you'll see a rookie quarterback come in and do really well, but the teams have simplified what it is that he has to do. He may have one, two, or three whereas Peyton Manning might have, you know, one through 15. So that's when you see the shift from, you know, a rookie quarterback who comes in and does really well at first, and then all of a sudden they struggle. It's because defenses have had a chance to study them back. You know what those one, two, and three are. Whereas, I don't care, you study Peyton Manning, you've still got one through 15 that you've got to figure out. It's much easier to figure out one through three even when they're, you know, great athletes and, and a lot of things. So that's the difference, and, the, and that's a lot of his brilliance. But, yes, I mean, Ty was like that. I, I asked him about a quarterback one time, and I won't say the name because he had two picks on that quarterback in the game. And I was like, Ty, I was like, two? And he's like, Coach, I can read him like a book I wrote. And I just started laughing. I was like, oh, my goodness. Because really it was. I mean, he could see it, and he probably could have had another one. But, yeah, it, it, I think he got pulled. Otherwise, he could have had another one. But, uh, yeah, I mean, he, he was that guy, and he is that guy. And, you know, there are certain players that just can do that. You know, Luke Eakley, Sean Lee, those are two linebackers that you see that, that same ability to play faster than maybe they should be able to because they see everything. And that was something I always said in my career is I would get faster as the game went, not slower, because I would learn more. And that's what great football players do. They get better through the course of the game because, you know, they, they start to see it and feel the rhythm and, uh, and play faster and freer. Sure. Sure. Well, Brady did that to uh, to the Atlanta Falcons uh, this last Super Bowl. I can tell you that, watching it up close and personal as an Atlanta person. Oh, yeah. Talk about getting better as it went on. Good Lord. Well, and it's funny because that was actually something I talked about that week going into Super Bowl when they asked what my pick is. And I said, listen, Atlanta is young and hungry, and they're going to come out on fire. However, what I'm worried about is that they may burn themselves out because it's not just the pace of the game. The, the weight of a big game wears you out quicker. And the week of something like that wears you out. You know, you're not sleeping the same. You're not. So what I predicted is that the experience of the Patriots would allow them to pull out in the end. I said if, if Atlanta can hold them off and hold it together and keep their pace, win. But I would expect that the Patriots would come back in the end. Now, I did not, by any stretch of the imagination, still believe that I was right when we went into halftime. I was like, okay, so maybe. Yeah, maybe not. Unfortunately, you were. Right. <laughs> but that's where you see that experience. And, you know, and Atlanta's another team, as you brought them up, that with a year of experience, and, and I believe that they've kept relatively intact, haven't they? Although they lost, what, their coordinator? Yeah. Oh, no, right. I think they're positioned well now. Yeah, they're positioned very well, and they're not going to make that same mistake. Mm-hmm. Right? For sure. Oh, I mean, Matt Ryan can't wait to, to 
to step onto another Super Bowl, you know, experience. I think, and I, I think it's that young, hungry defense that was their, their blessing and their curse in that game. And that defense will not make that mistake again. Talking football with you is fun. We need to, uh, I need to watch a game with you, girl. Yeah. Oh, anytime. That'd be fun. That That's would good. be fun. You'd show my little sports mind up. I can promise you that, sister. Oh, well, what we should do is uh, one of the things that I've been working on is I came up with a, a camp for women. We launched it with the Redskins last year. It's called A Day in the Life. And we actually bring women out on the field to get them into the game. And it's for, you know, of any age. It's not a boot camp where people are just throwing passes at you and you still don't know how to catch them. No, no, no. We're going to teach you each position and show you how those chess pieces fit together. Fun. Yeah, it's one of the So is that happening now? Is that in place now? Yeah, that's what we're working on right now. Um, Behind the scenes, the business rollout of, you know, it's my idea to have camps like that all over the country because, you know, it's it's such a great game. But I'm so sick of women saying, I think I'd love football, but my husband always says, honey, don't bother me. I'm watching the game. And I'm like, well, first of all, if you ask him a question and he gave you that answer, it's because he probably didn't know. And then they start laughing. And then the next question is, but we can teach you football. And it's designed in a way to make it really approachable and just change the way you watch the game. Is that information on your website now? It's not, but I, you know, if they, if they just ask me, it's something that we're working on bringing in, but we have, you know, we have some great videos and, and the whole deck and, and Good um, for you. Yeah. That is cool. You know, my, my 75 year old mom loves football goes to every single Michigan state game. And she knows an unbelievable amount about the game after going for years and years and years, but she might dig that. Oh yeah. I'll send you the link to it. Cause it's, it's something we can bring anywhere, you know, um, you know, we can bring it, we can easily bring it to your city. Wow. Jen Welter. Thanks so much for coming on. You are awesome. Anytime. Right back at you. Thanks, as always, for listening to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts. There you can listen to previous episodes and leave us a review, which helps other people find out about the show. For more about me, visit mollyfletcher.com. Until next time, stay curious and be bold.